The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hello and welcome to episode 21 of the Cinematography Podcast. 21. Our kid is old enough to drive. No. Yeah. Buy liquor. Buy, buy booze. Exactly. It's time. It's time. Well, and I think that we Ooh, should, and, and we should get- And drive a car in some places. We should, we should get super drunk after this. I'm lying. We're both already drunk. <laughs> you know, there is like a podcast about people who are talking about, I don't know, filmmaking and drinking. Really? I, I think we'd just be a ripoff of their show if we started doing that. I refuse to be derivative of anybody. So, Ilya, here we are. We are less than a week out from the National Association of Broadcasters Convention, otherwise known as NAB in the business. That's true. And you are going and I am not. That's also true. I would love to go, except my wife is going to apparently make a person at any point in time. And so I'm going to be a dad and it could happen while we were at NAB. That's like a prime week that it might happen. It could even happen while we're recording this right now. It could it could. I don't it want. Shouldn't. <laughs> I'd, I'd prefer to not be landlocked in uh, in Las Vegas. So I know you've talked about NAB in the past, but for those uninitiated or who missed that episode, how would you describe NAB? Yikes! Um, <laughs> it's going to come off as a little bit biased because I'm not someone who likes NAB, but NAB is like one of those necessary evils for for my business. Yeah. Uh, I have to go meet. So with it's people. evil. It is. It's it's kind of evil. It's interesting. You do get a lot of people all together in one place from all over the world at the same time. And if they are involved in some way in the motion picture or television or broadcast equipment or tech side of the industry, they're there. They're all together. So it's really easy to get to talk to people. And if you're on the post side, oh my God, the post stuff is, is well, massive. That's, that's yeah. part of my favorite part. Although like I do love wandering over to like weird radio tower equipment and being like, what the hell is this crap? It looks like in, it, it all looks very steampunk. Yeah. You're, you're, well, you're very open-minded and uh, other people just kind of like roll their eyes and like, I don't know what this is. And it's just in my way. So I think uh, that I appreciate it for its aesthetics uh, much more than for anything I could ever use it for. You actually were my guide the first time I ever went to NAB. And frankly, the first time I ever went to Las Vegas was in uh, 2003 and uh, you introduced me to people at Panasonic and Jan Crittenden, who's no longer there, hooked us up with a camera for a film I was making. And it, I find NAB to be exciting in in one regard and sometimes outrageously frustrating because you'll, you'll see somebody who's there to hawk a piece of gear that they don't understand. And when you ask them any questions, they can't answer them. No, the, the, the level of preparedness varies quite a bit from manufacturer to manufacturer, and especially with these larger multinational corporations. Sometimes you get a person who literally got a press briefing, the same briefing that the press got, like a few hours before you showed up. So they're there to sell the tech, but they don't actually know the tech that they're selling at some yeah. of these companies. Yeah. You know, I remember when Red first announced itself. I remember going to the Red Pavilion, whatever it was, that they'd set up there, and all they had was a fiberglass shell of what the Red One they thought at the time would look like, which was not what it ended up looking like and we all kind of stood around and looked at demos of the sensor and when it was over like I applauded and everyone else like was just steam pouring off of their head that they just wasted their time seeing something that was not existent at the time and I was like eh, they're trying I don't know it's a concept known as vaporware yeah. and there's plenty of people who when they first saw the red demo they were convinced it was vaporware there's a lot of people who show up with what's supposed to be the greatest thing since sliced bread and then voila it never comes to be or they didn't get the reaction but at the show no one's telling anyone that hey guess what we're actually going to fold this company and you're never going to hear from us again Oof. but there was a year and it was a few years ago now when 3d was really big that was uh, i think one of the last times i was there yeah that that year i ran into so many or met so many startup 3d companies and yeah, just going through my mind the entire time was like, you won't be here next year. And yeah. sure enough, 99% of them were not. I always talk about that year seeing the uh, 3D rig that was like the size of a shoebox and had a mirror in it. 
and cost twenty five thousand hmm, dollars. Bargain. And I was like, "Who's the same dad exactly?" <laughs> um, but also, uh, that being said, I also remember being there with you. Probably, I want to say like two thousand five ish, two thousand six ish. And we turned the corner, and there was this uh, military grade camera company that had taken their camera and turned it into the what is now the Phantom. Hmm, I think right, I yeah. think that they had already taken the name Phantom, and it was the first time that anyone had seen like thousand frame per second video or digital imaging and i just remember both of us kind of like stopping and being like what the fuck is that i want some of that and uh they're really still the, the market leader in that space i i would have thought that maybe some competitors would have risen up well i remember like talking to the guy there and it's like yeah we we set this up so that we could like we made these cameras so we could shoot like missiles through barns and slow it down to the point to see how much damage was happening, you know, in, in minor increments at a thousand frames per second. And then we thought, hey, I wonder if filmmakers would want to use this technology to make movies. And cha-ching, they sure do. <laughs> <laughs> and and we're willing to pay prices that were maybe not quite military, but, but still ridiculously high. <laughs> uh, no, those cameras are great. And, you know, it's like, you know, what would the Mythbusters have been without the Phantom camera? Oh, they, they probably wouldn't have been a show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and not just Mythbusters, but a thousand other. There was a whole one, a whole show on Pumpkin Chunkin. Have you seen that? Uh, no. Okay. Do you know what Pumpkin Chunkin is? Are you, you're giving me a blank stare right now. Uh, it's. I'm guessing it's you're throwing pumpkins. Yeah, there's these, it's, it's worth a Google, but if you type in like pumpkin chunkin, uh, there's a whole subculture of people who build these massive cannons and trebuchets and Uh catapults. And they have these competitions to who can launch a pumpkin the furthest. And it's, it's a interesting feats of engineering. I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I, I would never go do it, but there are people who spend big money, big, big money and their own ingenuity creating ways to launch pumpkins all i can say is uh suck on that starving countries <laughs> we we take food and we put it into a cannon and shoot it at high speeds yes so <laughs> so so dummies like me can go on the internet later and then watch replays of that yeah that's <laughs> i mean at least the mentos diet coke people they're not there's really not a lot of nutrition going on in either of those things here's the cool thing too is that over the last I'd say like seven years, a bunch of organizations, companies, uh, blogs, websites, whatever, Cinema 5D being one that I tune into a lot, throw people down on the NAB floor and they go around. They're like, hey, Benro, tell me about your new tripod. Hey, Adobe, show me this new thing that you've added to, uh, you know, audition or whatever. And so from the comfort of my house, uh, I can sit there and sort of pretend that I'm on the showroom floor at NAB and looking at stuff without all the walking around and talking to people. Yeah, there's quite a bit of that. And I've been guilty of doing a a little bit of that in the past, but I have to say that I kind of feel like that's the worst way to actually find out about any product. There's no, there's no like perspective and it's all very superficial. So uh, it's interesting to know that it exists, but whether or not it will actually work or apply to you, NAB is sometimes filled with all kinds of stuff that doesn't actually make it. There is that light field camera from a couple of years ago that was 11 feet long. Do you remember that one? I I remember hearing about it and maybe even I might've watched a video about it. Well, I mean, light field technology is still a thing that's in process. Yes, but. 11 feet long you know we all had to start out as a concept something or other it was there's some big money behind it and they spend huge money with uh, server space and cloud space and stuff from from google but yeah i, I don't mean to keep bringing it up but that is like uh that is just sort of epitomizes what a lot of stuff that launches well, it's like going to a like. concept car show where it's like yeah i'm not going to drive this weird ass concept car but it's an idea like i remember before canon released uh any of the c300 c500 kind of cameras they had a 4k camera that sort of looked like a hair dryer mm. that was like a it was just a concept camera mm. and it was like hey we're working on the technology to create this you know, or like when the AF100 came out, they had like, again, they just had the body out there. You couldn't put your hands on it. You couldn't touch it. And I remember almost getting into a fist fight with the uh, person from JVC when they had their first HDV camera and I couldn't make their models in their light, uh, n- not have the highlights clip. And I was like, who's this camera for, dude? You, yeah. Did I ever tell you what he said? Uh, <laughs> clearly not you. <laughs> he said... Uh, he said he eventually got there. He was like, this is a camera for people who want to say that they're in the HD field. This is probably like 2004. 
I don't know. This is this is for people who want to say that they are shooting in HD. Oh, so it's not for people doing a good job in HD. This is, you know, when we were all excited that we could record a technically HD signal onto a DV cam tape and and get kind of a sort of kind of HD-ish looking thing out of it. That was 14 years ago, Ben. I think it's time for you to move on. I'm not going to move on. I still <laughs> want to fight that guy. Uh, I'm personally most interested to see what Adobe's coming out with. And I feel like it's just kind of been a, a tradition in, in my house to be excited about editing software right around NAB because that was where Final Cut Pro would always announce stuff when uh, anyone gave a crap about Final Cut Pro. And uh, and now with Adobe, like every year Adobe takes a giant leap. And I thought last year they took one of the coolest leaps any company ever did. They did a survey of their users and they said, would you rather have better performance or us to work on more features? And people said better performance. So they had kind of an unsexy, like no groundbreaking new features release. But I got to tell you, it's a lot faster to work with uh, After Effects and Premiere hmm. and, awesome. and, uh, and Audition. I think the technology kind of dribbles to all of their products. So, Ben, we've just spent a long time talking about NAB. I'd like to point out that I cut most of it out, but it was probably too long. OK, great. Uh, now, now that it's been cut out, who's on the show today? Uh, today, uh, I'm very excited to say that we have Larry Fong. Larry Fong. I mean, when I heard that we were going to get Larry Fong on the show, I, I got super excited. I'm a giant fan of his work with Zack Snyder, 300, Watchmen, Kong Skull Island. I think it's great to talk to Larry. And Larry is also just a funny guy. He and, is. And a magician, by yeah. the way. Yeah, and, and Larry, one of the funniest people we've ever had on the show. He's hilarious. Had me in stitches. I actually, when I was editing, had to cut out a lot of just us laughing. It, uh, that, that's uh, that's easy to do. Uh, I mean, <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I listened to his liner. And I laughed listening to his liner. And, and, <laughs> and for anyone who's listening to the show right now who doesn't know what a liner is, liner is industry term for when someone uh, basically introduces themselves and says what show or program they're on. So like I would say, I'm Ilya Friedman and you're listening to the Cinematography Podcast. Well, uh, Larry's first take was so funny, I just I couldn't control it. It was so good. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good guy. So anyway, here he is, Larry Fong. <laughs> The Cinematography Podcast Interview. All right. Well, Larry Fong, thank you so much for coming in. Glad to be here. Could not be more excited to have you on board. I always start off asking the same question because I think it stimulates kind of conversation about cinematography in general. And I have a belief that cinematographers tend to start either with a composition in mind and light into it, or they start with an idea of lighting in mind and find compositions within the lighting that they create. Uh, my question could also be bullshit, so you can call me out for that. But uh, where do you think you begin with with an image? If I hand you a script, where does the image start in your mind? This is like the question of, the, and for a songwriter, do they write the lyrics first or the music first? Exactly. I can't. I think it's both. Boring question uh, answer. But when I read the script, I see both. But once the the work starts, when I'm in prep. It's more the lighting because I have to create the situation that the composition will be later found in. And when we're rigging sets and whatnot, actually I'm trying to set up rooms to be kind of self-lit or motivate the light from the set first. So I would say when I read the script, I'm seeing the people talking. I'm trying to see the movie in my mind. So I think that's the compositions. Mm -hmm. But when I get into the work, it's definitely about the lighting. And when you talk about thinking about like how you're going to light it, because I guess that is the practical plan. Like as soon as you start breaking down a practical plan and you work on like the biggest films that are being made today. You work on giant, giant, multi-hundred million dollar movies, correct? <laughs> you put it that way, you give it's me kind of intimidating. It's, it's super intimidating. No, no, I mean, you work, on, you work on giant blockbuster movies. And so I always wonder with those kinds of movies too, how do you keep the art alive when so much of it, I imagine from my stance a million miles from that, how much of it is management and how do you keep the art alive in the management that you have to do on those kinds of movies? Mm, it's a lot of management because I think I kind of feel the same way in the morning for a simple shoot. Like last week I did a tiny little shoot. And it was just people playing basketball in a, in a day exterior. It doesn't mean like there's less caring or less preparation or less nervousness the night before. I think in comparison, if I do a giant scene, like a giant night exterior in a, in a big area, then there's been more homework put into it. Yeah. And I've, pre-scouted with the rigging crew and they've done so much and as as the days progress when it's coming together i get notes on it and they do all most of the hard work but it's all talked about on the scout and i'll see it in my mind and i'll and i'll tell my gaffer the broad strokes of where you know let's say the where the how the building's going to be lit is it going to be uplit or a wash from the moon 
how much light comes from within it. But that's the background, right? Yeah. So when the people are here in the foreground next to the camera, that's all the same. That's relatively simple. That's just a few lights and not much else. So it's not that much different for me. Again, it's the rigging crew. They're the ones that are working all night for days. But if you're if you're working on something like, for instance, Watchmen or 300, are the artistic creative decisions being made like months and months and months out? How does one kind of keep the creative spark alive in those films? Mm, that's interesting. You're right. I mean, if, if you, again, I'll just use the night exterior example. If there's buildings way, way back there, you kind of have to make the right decision when you tech scout it weeks before of how you want it lit that you can't change your mind. So you have to have a good eye and, and a kind of to pre-visualize how you want those buildings to look like because you can't change that on the day. But luckily, that's the background. Yeah. So if you feel confident about that, again, it's weird because the background is out of focus. Hopefully not too many people are looking at it. So again, for me, all the concentration is, is, is in the middle ground and in the foreground. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of when you're in your zone. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's a few lights and it's not, a, it's, it's just within 20, 30, 40 feet of where you're shooting. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Let's go back and talk about how you started out in the business or even like, did you go to film school? Did you start on a track? And at what point did you decide you wanted to pursue cinematography specifically? Mm, how far do you want me to go back? Like making Super 8 movies kind of go, stories or? Yeah, go back to where you first, where did you first find the spark for making movies? Mm, I think like everyone, you know, we all like to watch movies, but in junior high, I found out my dad had a movie camera. You know, he had a cabinet of cameras. And I think I did photography first. I must have, because I remember I talked him into making me a dark room. I remember doing film. Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I developed my own film. I had a larger and did all that stuff. And that was in junior high. So that's, what, 12, 13. But then I found out he had a movie camera. But I'm giving away my age here. But he actually had a regular 8, not Super 8. Mm-hmm. And it was a bell and howl, and you wind it up, and it would have 16 millimeter film in it, 50 foot reels. Actually, I do remember that. The <laughs> okay. first camera I ever had was a split eight, and yeah. Super 8 was already out, but it was a wind up. I forget the model of it, and I messed around with it a little bit, but it was so expensive, and I was like yeah. 10 years old, and I was in Florida, but I remember <laughs> it came in the little daylight reels. Yeah. But it was crazy because you had to find a black place, you know, with no, with no light, and then thread it. You'd shoot for half of it, then you had to flip the film over because it would only shoot the left half of the film, and now it'd shoot the right half of the film. And then when it got processed, they'd cut it and connect the ends, so it made yeah. a hundred foot long, eight millimeter wide. But it was just made out of sixteen millimeter film, which earlier was the home movie format, right? Yeah, yeah. But I digress. Eventually, Super 8 came with the little cartridges, like you said, and I started making little movies. And of course, they're monster and blood and explosions. and So nothing has changed. That. <laughs> That's true. I literally nothing. That. Think about that. I literally had monsters, <laughs> stop motion, blood, like knives, gunshots, uh -huh. gore, rubber masks, and actually visual effects, if you can believe that. You're like scratching into the emulsion and stuff? Yes. Scratch them to make lasers, like kind of like Star Wars. But also, I found a way to rewind the film with, in the Super 8 cartridge so I could backwind it and do double exposure. So I could do a split screen where you can oh, do nice. that thing where I'll make my friends would run behind the street <laughs> lamp, pull, and then vanish, that old thing. Nice. And I also did rear projection, which is crazy. What? And yeah. Super 8 rear So you'd, yeah, shoot, you'd shoot a background plate on Super 8 and then rear project it against? I did, one frame at a time on to a tracing paper. And I would do stop motion in the foreground. Ah. Uh, Insane. Very Ray I'm Harryhausen. Yes, he was my hero. Mine too. Oh, Nerdiest cool. moment of my life was meeting Ray Harryhausen. Me too. I was signing laser discs at the Virgin Megastore. I saw him at the Academy when I first moved to LA, which was like 99. They were doing a screening of, I want to say it was the seventh voyage of Sinbad and the beast from 20,000 fathoms. Cool. And then he was there and yeah, I, I, wow. I, I got weak in the knees being in the room with the guy. So good. Also did prosthetic, right? Makeup. Cause that was the same deal. Yeah. So meeting, Rick Baker and meeting Dick Smith was also crazy, if you know who they are. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I actually started as a special effects makeup artist. Whoa! So, no and, way. and probably one of the other geekiest moments. I never met Dick Smith, which is weird because I lived in Florida and he lived in Florida and I knew a bunch of people who took his but course. But you talked to him on the phone. I never did. I oh. never did because I because I'm an asshole. <laughs> but I did meet Rick Baker because a friend of mine, the woman who had kind of mentored me in makeup, was uh, when I first moved to LA. She was working on The Grinch, and she brought me to Whoa. their stage. And there was Rick Baker, and yeah, I I, I kind of shit my pants. It was kind of awesome. <laughs> but it wasn't real. It was like latex foam rubber <laughs> uh, foam rubber shit. shit yeah, 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 yeah. 
I, I fumbly text myself. <laughs> I, I love all that stuff. A DIY filmmaking today is obviously ubiquitous and anyone can, and people are doing it on their phone or on DSLRs or whatever. But like the amount of effort that went into doing Super 8 back then, you know, it's all, it, it was all the same steps as making a regular movie pretty mm-hmm. much. Yeah. Do you still have any of those old films? I might. I hope so. If my mom is hit me in my mom's, oh, she doesn't have a basement anymore. Oh, oh no. I might have it somewhere. Um, so I was doing Super 8 movies and stop motion and pixelation and all that stuff. I was interested in movies, of course. There was Jaws and Star Wars and all that. And, and you just thought it would be cool to make movies. But I live way out in the suburbs and I didn't know anyone in the industry. And where, it's kind of a pipe dream. The suburbs of where were you? I went to Rolling Hills High School. A lot of horses and trees, mm-hmm. if you like that. What state is I that in? I don't really like that. Yeah, this the state, California. Oh, it's oh, so you were kind of down near Palos Verdes Way. Oh, okay. You know, so you, you had you had proximity to the like you were you could sort of almost see the business from your house. Yeah, but you're, it's very isolated there. Of know? course. And so, but something did happen interesting in high school. My friend, his parents were divorced, and sometimes he would say, "Come up, you know, and stay with me with my dad because we live in this cool place called Bel Air." And I go, "I don't know what that is, but sure." So I'd hang out there, and we'd make sometimes little movies. And but there was a kid across the street who would watch us make movies and goes, hey, I make movies too. Can I hang out? And this kid is named J.J. Abrams. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of him. No, no, I don't know who he is. But he was a precocious, very talented kid. And um, we became quick friends because we liked film. We liked. He also did prosthetics and was also talking to Dick Smith. He also loved magic, which I love magic. And he loved music, which I do. And we, even though he was four years maybe younger, you know, we traded numbers and we became fast friends, even though... In those days, that's too far, you know, it's a long distance relationship. But we talked a lot, and um, it was so weird. I would call him, and he'd go, "Okay, uh, please hold line one." You know, he's just, he's this, he's this multitasker, even at age twelve. Nice. He's the same, and he's he's awesome and talented, and he deserves everything. But I got to see this rise of J.J. Abrams. But I don't say that to name drop. I say that because we made some movies together on Super Eight. Yes. And then years later, you made Super Eight. Where's the weird music? <laughs> I'll add it later. Theremin, because the <laughs> We both have a theorem. No, but I think that, so, I think I think that that's awesome that you were making super eight super eight shorts or whatever with JJ Abrams, and then later you made a movie. You made the movie a, called there's, Super there's Eight. There's a story there. Strangely enough, because he had I think a, a cameraman guy in his high school that was doing his project, so I actually did the special effects makeup. He had a, this. It was a young Peter DeLuise, I think, who was at his school, and he wanted to have this effect where he was electrocuted, so he had to have this rippling skin effect. So. From my Dick Smith, <laughs> all the magazines I read, I got these weird, I didn't have bladders, but I got balloons mm-hmm. from the drugstore, put them on the arm, glued them, then put kind of, I think, a stocking over it so it matched skin. And then I had the syringes, right, with the tubes. Yep. And I'd pump them, and then so they do this real, weird wriggly alternating motion on his arm like he was being possessed or nice. something. And I, I don't know if he has that film, but, but that's cool. I bet he could make a lot of money if he just released all his old Super 8 films from high school. It was called High Voltage. I People remember. be way into it. I made a movie called Toast Encounters of the Burnt Kind. <laughs> and <laughs> there was a Super 8 film festival, teen film festival. And somehow this guy met JJ and we brought people together. And at the New York Theater, there was one night where all these teen kids, I was just not a teen anymore, but they showed JJ's movies, my Toast Encounters movie, <laughs> a couple other ones, but also a movie from a young Matt Reeves. Oh, wow. Crazy, right? Totally. Yeah. So socially, I've run into him, you know, through JJ over the years. And I'm like, look, look what happened. There's something in the water, I think. Those were good times. So did you end up going to, uh, did you follow this to go to film school or did you, uh, did you bust out and start working in the business? No, I, thanks to being Asian, my parents were very much into the education thing. So off to UCLA I go. And um, I UCLA? go to two years, UCLA. Mm. And you can apply after two years. And But I, I was rejected utterly. So I have a degree in something else from UCLA. Nice. <laughs> linguistics. Very useful degree. But I loved it, to tell you the truth. I'm glad I went. And I, and I still love linguistics and language. Oh. And Got a good linguistics podcast for you. Do you? Yeah. What? It's called Lexicon Valley. It's hosted by John McWhorter. I'm going to sign up for that one. Totally. But I did take, I took Chinese, Italian, and Hebrew. I don't, not sure why I took Hebrew until 20, 30 years later in Detroit when I worked with Wonder Woman, brought her to the big screen. Yes, that was me. And that's when I realized it was all worth it to learn Hebrew. Because <laughs> <laughs> she would come on the set and I'd speak to her in Hebrew. Oh, wow. And I was looking over and go, what are they saying? They, they came up with their own Wonder Woman language. It's crazy. 
and then <laughs> you converse. And to be able to do that, you know, I can die now. And <laughs> so you never know when you're younger why you do things. See, I was raised Jewish, so I went to like five years of Hebrew school, yeah. and I couldn't, I couldn't, I, I can't look at Hebrew and make words out of it. And it was five years that I had to go to it. I don't know what we did for five so years. So easy. I'll bet, you know, it's like you don't know your prayers, anything. I, I mean, I, I, I know them by heart, oh, okay. but I don't like, I don't, if you showed me a, a page, <laughs> if I was trying to read an Israeli newspaper, I would be useless. Me too. So you went to UCLA, but you were studying linguistics. You weren't studying film. Were you still yes. active in the film world during that whole period? Good of question. Time? I went to the film department. I put my name up on the bulletin board so I could work on films. And um, I worked on a lot of student films. I did some prop building and I did some rotoscoping. Remember that? Oh, my God. I didn't even know the guy. All night long, I was rotoscoping at an animation stand for, like, for this film. I don't know why. Because it was cool. Oh, and at that time, I heard that the first Star Trek movie was going to be made. So I applied for that, and for some reason I thought I was going to be hired, so I quit school, but it was a misunderstanding. He was not being hired at all <laughs> because of wishful thinking, and I'm insane and, and young. So I took some time off school. But then when I came back, uh, I finished in linguistics, and then after two years of looking for a job at a linguistics store, <laughs> I um living at home, and in the newspaper I saw there's a photography job. And I go, oh, I like photography. And it was taking pictures of the kids you know, school kids, their ID photos. Mm -hmm. And also when you set up the benches and they all sit on their class and then the teacher's there and they hold a little board that says, you know, Mr. Ilya's third grade class. <laughs> That's what I was doing. I had the benches in my car and I had the, the Hasselblad camera and these Norman strobes. But the point was I had a Hasselblad and Norman strobes. Yeah. So time to develop the photography, right? Yeah, yeah. So I get all the books and magazines and I go, I've got to learn photography. That's what I got to do. I want to be a photographer. I built softboxes in my garage, started learning how to take pictures of people, studying product photography. And I took a class at um, a place called UCLA Extension. Oh, yeah, remember. of course. Yeah, yeah. that weird giant book that would come in the mail. Yeah, yeah. And I saw one that said commercial photography, I think. It said learn how to shoot, you know, cars, people, products. And I didn't really know what it was, but I took the course. And the, the teacher I learned so much from, I can't remember his name, but he mentioned he went to a school named Art Center. And about, you know, his career, where he can make a lot of money shooting products. And I didn't even know that was a thing. After the class, I go to my parents and I said, you know, there's schools that can teach you photography. You know, it's a career. And they go, what do you mean? A photographer like you, you're going to be in, in the war? Like, for LA Times? <laughs> and it's funny things, because I kind of thought the same thing, too. Like, people don't know someone's taking a picture of that Apple or that stereo or that car, right? But, and he was mentioning you know, the, the money you could make. And I thought, hey, mom, you know, it's like, you can make really good money. Oh, really? Okay. Well, we'll get you started at this art school if you can get in. And then we'll have to see after that because it's really expensive. And so it's really hard to get into Art Center. I took a year putting a portfolio together because I didn't know much about photography. And I did, uh, you know, fine art, photo, portraiture, food, photography. I just figured they'd want to see everything. And so it took me a year and I actually got in. I took photography for two years and then switched over to the film program like I wanted to do way before. Mm -hmm. Things seemed to be going well. I have met great friends there. I was learning a lot. I met some people there at Art Center. Zack Snyder, Tarsem, Tarsem Singh. Yes, the director. Well, Michael Bay actually went there as, in his master's program at the tail end of my time there. Crazy. Yeah. So like the music video world of the 90s went to Art Center. Kind of, and we loved, you know, I mean, we were emulating that stuff. It was all happening, and we were just going crazy over what was happening, that Fincher was doing, and everybody else. I guess it was the 80s, too, like Losing My Religion. That's 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 late uh, 80s, 80s, correct? Mid, early 90s. Early 90s? So the mid and late 80s was when I was there, and so we would do fake music videos, fake commercials, and if we could afford it, fake, you know, I mean, not fake, <laughs> short films. And then I ended up working, shooting for them, not Michael Bay, but um, for Tarsem and Zach, I did a lot of their student films. Mm -hmm. So oh, coming wow. out of there, our reels kind of mixed and matched because we all worked on each other's stuff. Well, this brings up a point that I, I, when we talk about going to film school, because people will sometimes reach out to us and say, like, is it worth it to go to film school? You know, because you can go out and buy a DSLR and get Adobe Premiere Resolve or whatever, and you can go make all the movies you want. 
but I feel like one of the best reasons to go to school is to make connections. And obviously yes. you worked with two amazing directors, one of whom you'd go on to work with, both of whom you'd go on to work with uh, professionally. Mm-hmm. Tarsem did the Losing My Religion video. Did you shoot any other, any, uh, have you some shot other a, music videos with him and some commercials? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then obviously, you know, your work with Zack Snyder is the stuff of textbooks now, you know, like yeah, it, first many music videos and many commercials and then 300. Yeah. 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 Obviously to me, that's a ringing endorsement for go to film school because you'll meet people that you'll end up working with, hopefully. Hmm, good point. Very good point. Because I know at UCLA, I didn't make any friends. None? <laughs> but, but I didn't think about that. But I thought, I really need to make friends if I'm going to... I never. I didn't read a thing that said, make friends because you may work with them later. I just thought, as a personal thing, why would I do this thing now I really, really want to do and not make lasting friends? Yeah. That was the smartest thing I ever did. <laughs> So when do you finish up with that program? Around 89, I believe. But Tarsan was so good that he was already signed to a label and doing music videos. Zach graduated. It wasn't long before he was signed as a director. I started shooting music videos right away. You know, not great ones, but somehow, because I was shopping my reel around. And even though I had no experience, there was some weird imagery. on. <laughs> I wish I had a copy of my reel. It's on one inch tape somewhere or three quarter. Nice. But there's some cool stuff on it. Well, take me into that world though, because it's weird. I don't think people think about it the same way that it was back then, but music videos were kind of music videos and feature films were kind of the pulse of pop culture at the time. So, you know, when a new music video came out from REM or whoever, you couldn't just get it on demand. You couldn't just look it up on YouTube on Vivo and watch it. You had to like sit there and watch MTV until it played and you'd be exposed to all this stuff. But what was interesting to me was what was being embraced at the time were all these interesting photographic techniques and and a ton of techniques came out of that time that ended up filtering into features and television and, and stuff like that down the line. So what was it like working in music videos at that time when there was actually money in it? Money in it? Well, wasn't there? Um, no. <laughs> that all makes sense what you just said until the money part. Okay, so I'm wrong. Um, oh, no, no, I, I buy that I'm wrong about the money. Um, well, I mean, like, when you look at, like, the Losing My Religion video, which you shot. Yes. R.E.M. was one of the top bands of mm-hmm. the time, and, like, that that's Tar Sam, and it's got, like, outrageously high production value. I mean, there, there, there obviously was some kind of budget for it. Um, yes, but not a lot, because either... The band would have to pay for it, or it was loaned to them from the company. No one really knew what they were doing. Mm-hmm. But no, it was a lot of friends. It was Tarsem's girlfriend who was the production designer on that. I remember working for not a lot of money. Mm-hmm. I remember doing jobs for hundreds of dollars. I was starting to pay the bills, but I wouldn't say there's good money. And I didn't, by the way, do any of those giant like Madonna videos or something. That, yeah. Michael Jackson, that was... That was a different level, but it was always really long hours and then kind of crazy improvising. But luckily, you know, um, because of the art school, like you said, Zach and Tarsem and I were developing aesthetics, studying great photographers and painters. Mm -hmm. And Tarsem's approach was always, you know, give these kids that are, that just want to watch rock and roll, give them an art education, even though they don't realize they're getting it. And Zach That carries into his features. Yeah. Like, like, uh, I remember seeing the cell and I'm a big fan of this weird ass, uh, I think he's a Norwegian painter named odd Nerdrum, And there were like frames of the cell that were like lifted from odd Nerdrum mm-hmm. paintings. Yes. Tarzan was never afraid of lifting. And he I always used that quote about the secret of creativity is knowing how to hide your sources. It was actually printed in the MTV award program, like a <laughs> thing right there that, you know, he told him to put there just so everything was above board. Um, well, oh, oh, the things we hated, though, when we we're going to art school was the videos that were just rock and roll is running back and forth across the stage with a whole bunch of backlight and smoke. Yeah. Like, we hated that. And so much to the point where Tarzan wanted to do more and more videos with less and less of the performers. He wanted to do, he wanted to do videos, I remember, with no performers. Like, you don't see them. And labels are like, eh, we can't really do that. Or he wanted to do, let's do the whole video out of focus. And I was, no. <laughs> But did you notice like the flash frame stuff we're doing, the out of focus stuff, the crazy panning stuff? It, it's not completely original, but we were doing all that in film school and in our early years, because for one thing, that didn't cost anything. And it's just cool, weird stuff. You know, all that stuff, we're taking the film out, exposing it, stomping on it, baking it, that, that became so popular. And again, I'm not claiming originality on all that stuff. But that's what that's what's that was fun to me about like that period of time in music videos, because mm-hmm. I felt like there was just enormous experimentation and yes. experimentation led to 
like I was the audience for that, you know, like I was, I graduated high school in 1989 and I was, I was the kid who was glued to MTV all the time watching that stuff. And to me, when I would see a look that I'd never seen before that I would just stay to try and figure out, I was kind of analytical about it because I was on my way to going to film school. It would just capture me. I remember like when camera ramping started uh, Mm -hmm. back then, like suddenly like one person did it and then suddenly you saw it in every music video and every commercial. But it was sort of like a laboratory out of which the techniques that were used in sure. television and movies and everything else kind of came from. Mm-hmm. Well, the funny thing is that by the time Zach did 300, he wanted to do the, the, the speed ramp. I'm like, oh, man, this is in every commercial. And you really want to do this? It's, it seems so pop culture-ish. The interesting thing that we did was we didn't really do speed ramping on the set. We did it later. Did it in post? Yep. But part of the reason was, remember how it was zooming in and doing all this stuff? We had three, two or three cameras running at the same time at three lens sizes so that later the editor could choose the best points to zoom in and out of. Otherwise, how, like how many takes do you exactly. have to do the nail? You know, like it zooms right into the hand when he throws it and pulls wide and all that. Well, so, I, I want to give a shout out right now, actually, oh, to that? a guy named Chris Chaka, who asked, who asked me the question via Twitter, wondering how he composes the trademark Zack Snyder ramp up, ramp down in action shots. I know they can't be all post effects. And, what, uh-huh. and Chris Chaka... What <laughs> what Larry is saying is that it all was a post effect, correct? Not all post effect because the thing was since the zoom had to be a post thing, we needed, I just said that, we had three cameras on the same head, wide, medium, and long, and then we operated the long lens to compose what we thought would be the best. Mm-hmm. And in post, you get this morph zoom, and that's digital of technology, of course, that would, would blend that together. And the speed ramping, because we'd shoot the whole thing, you know, 360 frames per second. So you would overcrank it on film. I remember reading the American Cinematographer article about that, how you did that, and being like, that's fancy pants. Yeah, everything's slow motion, amazing. and then later it sped up, yeah. rather than the other way around. And done so many times since, and again, we weren't the first, so. But I guess it worked, parts of it. <laughs> So you have two things in common with uh, somebody who was on the podcast earlier, uh, Roberto Schaefer. Mm. One is that you you started doing a lot of music video work. Yes. And the other, and I think it's interesting to me that they go hand in hand, is that you also shot the Red Shoe Diaries. Oh, that's right. He did. Roberto and Dan Mandel. That is so funny. You know why? Because Zalman King smartly thought, let's get these young music video DPs that are stalwarts and we'll get them on and maybe we'll have some cool imagery. And I do think that that show did <laughs> did have like for, especially for its time, it had mm-hmm. some pretty impressive, interesting photography for, you know, what was basically, it was for Showtime, right? But yeah. it was Showtime's version of Skinamax kind of stuff. Right. But I remember that it always had a great look to it. Did it? I'm too afraid to look back at it again. I don't think, <laughs> I don't think mine stuff was very good. I remember struggling a lot because that was my first long form stuff. Really? And it was, I remember having a tough time. I do remember, you know, like thinking, okay, we're turning around now. You know, long form is totally different, right? So does he keep the backlight or do we change it? And I remember the gaffer going, it's already backlight. No, just do it. He should be front light now. That's what, that's what, that's what Jordan would do. I remember him. He said that. So, so whatever was the least <laughs> amount of work, <laughs> that's what worked for that gaffer. And that's what we shot. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say that there was a young Matt LeBlanc in my episode. Nice. Who was just about to quit acting. I was eating lunch with him and he said, I'm tired of this. I've been doing these weird gladiator movies in Italy and this and this is it. And I said, no, man, you've, you've got that star. You've got <laughs> I it. I, I do not say this to people. You know, I wasn't trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to you know, I, I really said, dude, like, no, 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 no. So I saw him in a public place about 15 years later. No, because right away he got friends. And so I'd like to take credit for Matthew LeBlanc's fame. You're welcome, Matthew. Matthew, if you're out there. Remember that talk? Yes. <laughs> What's interesting, and you just kind of brought it up, is coming out of, I'm going to say, kind of like specialty, artsy, music video-y stuff that you were doing kind of early in your career, moving into long form as you did with Red Shoe Diaries, you then start doing a lot of television. What are some of the interesting challenges that you kind of overcame? Like if somebody else was coming out of doing short form or commercials and moving into uh, into TV or longer form, what are some of the big lessons that you could save them? I have to say that, you know, I went to film school wanted to do the movies. And then when it came out, commercials and music videos, which was fine and a great proving ground, you forget or you never did learn about how to through long form, which more than a pretty picture is coverage and telling the story over one or two hours that are not just a series of pretty pictures. How, how do you put that together? How do you use the wide shots and the close shots together? How do you, different sections of the film have a different look and how does it build? Kind of like the difference between doing a poem and let's say a novel where you really 
think it and you can't just I'm just gonna wing this and see how it works which was the cool thing about music videos right you have a responsibility mm-hmm. in a movie to have a through line and and help the director with that so that you know it's an experience and was lost one of the first big TV shows that you uh, you worked on yes absolutely the way that came about was I think at that point I've been doing 10 or 15 years of commercials and couldn't do a movie to save my life I was going to Sundance I was schmoozing doing everything and no films were coming by. I think I was doing a, some kind of, yeah, a commercial. And I was trying to help out the director and the agencies by saying, you know, what the shot should be from the other side because of our screen direction. I May mean, I suggest that we shoot the camera from here? You know, that's what yeah. we do. And I remember the comment was from the producer, can you please shut up and just shoot the boards? Oh, my God. And that's when I had to go outside and have a cigarette, although I don't smoke. And... <laughs> I really had to, had to take a walk. And after that shoot, I, I was had a whole, I don't drink much, but in my mind, I'm getting drunk with bottles of whiskey over the weekend and contemplating everything. And that's when I happened to get a phone call from J.J. Abrams that said, uh, hey, Larry, you know, I know you don't do TV and you don't like really want to do that. I've asked you before, but I have a TV pilot coming up. Yes, I will do it. I don't had care he asked what you, He'd asked is. you before, like he'd asked you before and you'd said no. Yeah. I mean, not a specific thing, but, you know, you're successful. I'm successful. And we should do something. And me foolishly was trying to avoid TV for some reason because I was enjoying commercials mm-hmm. up to that last shoot. <laughs> commercials, I learned so much and I was traveling around and, and um, seeing the world and doing so many great things and making good money. And TV just seemed like I was going to be locked into something. Yeah. So and I still wanted to do a movie, but I just said, yes, whatever it is. Yes. It ends up being the script and he, I read it and I go, oh, well, this is weird. Okay. A plane crashes on an island. Like, how does that become a series? <laughs> 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 he said, don't worry about it. We're working on it. That came together really quickly. It was the, uh, at the time, the most expensive pilot I think ever shot wow. from what I hear. But it was amazing because at one point we're shooting on the beach and we're action and we're dolling, we're doing this stuff and all of a sudden after the set of him and I just looked at each other and then just laughed hysterically and fell down in the sand and we're rolling around the sound and, and it just culminated to realize that we're actually doing something together after being high school students dreaming about it and then this has all happened but we never really talked about it or processed it and then it just suddenly hit us one day during sunset and it was one of those great moments that you feel like you know the stars are aligned even though it was the most expensive uh, pilot ever shot the funny thing in the movie industry or TV is that there's still never enough money. Right? Of course. Or time. Right. It seems like the bigger the movie to me, like the less you have or the more you're reprimanded as if you're trying to. <laughs> <laughs> like, I didn't write that scene. <laughs> <laughs> I remember we were doing a scene early on in the the pilot. I think Jack and Kate and Charlie, is that their names? <laughs> They're in, tr- stuck in a tree. It's raining, and they're I think hearing or thinking what they're hearing a monster for the first time, and then so they have to run, right? So we realized during the scout and all this, this should be a cable cam shot. They're running, running, running through the jungle, and the camera should be in the air, flying backwards. But as happened on every film I've ever done and TV show, I didn't and still have never done cable cam shot. Really, to yes, this day? To this day, you think you are, and then a week before they say, "Yeah, you know, it's too expensive." Yes, yeah, see, even with the films I'm on. So my riggers and the stunt crew, they built, they put these wires from tree to tree and they built a giant cage of speed rail, which is basically pipe, and they pull it. So my camera operator was sitting in this kind of cage, flying through the jungle, being pulled by a wire, <laughs> like on a clothesline. <laughs> That's how we did that, where all three are running towards camera and they go under the camera. Nice. So then we realized we need the close-ups and we thought that we can't do close-ups because he can't frame it up and it's all wiggly and... We can't keep it in focus, and with the rain, it's a disaster. So this is where the magic background comes in, because JJ, like I said, and I are really into magic. Part of magic is knowing the least you can do to make it seem like something's happening and not doing anything unnecessary that's not being used. So we realized that with all this rain and these dark forests, that we could just have them stand there in place and make believe they're running, have our long lens, wiggle the lens around, and at some point, JJ and I, it was so funny, we just got branches, we're waving the branches through the lens as if... Yeah, they're going backwards through That's trees hilarious. and stuff. And I think there's on the making of, you can see us giggling like stupid children with branches waving them through the lens. Like it just makes sense. You throw the background out of focus, yeah, you can't yeah, yeah. even tell that they're not really moving. Yeah. Well, if you look at it, sure, you can tell. It's not that great. But you had to, we have to do something. <laughs> the point is, when the chips are down, you got to do something. Yeah, so from no cable cam to standing in place and 
waving branches around. That's the kind of thing you have to think on your feet, which JJ is an expert at. And I like to think I am. How many years did you end up working on, uh, on Lost? I did the pilot and then I was there only for about half the first season for four or five episodes. Mm -hmm. Cause again, I still had the commercial career thing going. I said, JJ, I'll do the pilot, but I don't want to get locked into the thing. Not because I'm too good for it, but that's my career arc. That was hap- That's what was happening. And I thought, I don't ever want to go back to Hawaii and do this again. Your first move to, to movies is 300, correct? Yes. That's your first feature. Yes. That's quite a first feature. Well, first of all, it was pretty hard to sell me for JJ's movie because the network didn't know who I was. And I had a very nerve wracking interview, but somehow JJ said, you know, there's, there's no one else I want to work with. You tell me who. And Powerful. that's still for Lost. That's for Lost. On 300, if I had never done Lost, that would have been another hurdle. They mm-hmm. would have said, who's that? And they did a little bit. He's only done TV. <laughs> it's always like <laughs> commercial thing. Can't do TV and TV think you can't do movies and just goes around in circles. Right. It's not on your reel. We don't know you can do it. But 300 to me is like such an unusual looking movie. And yes. it comes, I think a year or two after sin city, which is another mm-hmm. Frank Miller property right. that also had kind of an eccentric look yes. to it. And that one was black and white. Yes. But 300 kind of reinvented the wheel on sort of, I, I don't want to say the movies that are made primarily shot against green screen, but there's a lot of green screen yes. in that kind of a movie. It's hard to even compare 300 to anything else because it creates such a, of mm-hmm. its own world. And so much of that is in the cinematography. How did you guys mm-hmm. go about constructing the idea for how you were going to make it look the way you did? Oh, well, thank you, first of all. But I think Zach gets most of the credit because he got the script and he did out of his own pocket, a test film. I didn't shoot it, but he went to on on stage and I think he had a top light on there and it was a one take kind of guy slaughtering people with an extreme, you know, grade on it and speed ramping Mm -hmm. and blood flying in everywhere. And I guess that sold the studio if they weren't already. And he asked me to do it and I read the script and I thought, man, this is a lot of killing. (laughs) It's not really my kind of thing. But when he explained that, you know, there's plenty of swords and sandals movies around that time, right? Yeah, Gladiator, Gladiator, Alexander, Troy, sorry. Troy Troy was things like that. I think Alexander was a few years after, but I could be wrong. You know what I mean? Those kind of films. So he said, you know, the point of this is just a visual exercise. And instead of thinking of sword and sandals, think maybe sword and sandals mixed with The Matrix. (laughs) Which, I mean, that's a great way to describe it. Yeah, he said it's only about the look, really. And I thought, how many times do you hear that, right? <laughs> and I thought, you know, we'd work together. I get his aesthetic. You know, th- this could be really good. I jumped on that, and we shot that in Montreal. And it's funny what you say about the green screen, because unlike Sin City, which is all green, where people are sitting on green boxes, 300, the green screen was always in the distance. Yeah. If you look at the middle ground, the ground was real, whether it's the wheat field, whether it was um, the palace, whether it was walking through the city of Sparta. All those sets were real and huge. Only in the background, you know, when it was sky or distance, was it green. It wasn't just because we don't want to build the sets or because we're going to make the backgrounds fantastical. The point was that we we're going to make everything look fantastical. Yeah. If you look at the Frank Miller graphic novel, it's watercolor. And Zach was saying, we got to make it look like this, painterly. <laughs> How do you do that? And so... For one thing, the skies, if you look at them, they're, they look like um, watercolors. They were watercolors. Grant Freckleton designed this look where a lot of it was just like thrown coffee yeah. on paper and water. And and every shot we did, by the way, I had a version of his background that was going to go in the shot so I could have the feel and the tone and also lighting direction, lighting quality. It was never one of those things where some people think you just put someone against the green with flat light and just put the background later and it'll work out, kind of like the weatherman. Mm-hmm. Not so much. Although the technology is not that different. No, but so, you really, I mean, there's there's something so textural about that movie and Watchmen. The texture you're picking up, whether it's in front of a green screen or in front of a practical mm-hmm. set, I can't really put words to it, but it has a look that doesn't look like anything else I've ever seen. Mm. Both of those movies feel like they were shot by the same person, even though they have right. radically different looks. Really? But there's something there's something about the skin textures or hmm. something, the color palette. It's, it, there's a level of control and precision going on there that you don't see in a lot of movies, period. Thank you. I remember being young and sometimes wondering what I was doing, but, <laughs> but there was a lot of experimentation about how we're going to get that painterly look I was talking about. And so we would take the film, we'd go into the uh, DI suite, and DI was very, very new at this time. And I remember being uh, doing our telecinings in film school thinking, when would we be able to do this in movies instead of just commercials? For real. 
you know, 10, 15 years later. We would do all the usual stuff that we do for commercials and music videos, turn those knobs, you know, blow out the highlights, crush it, you know, crunch it. But it was just looking like music video and almost electronic. And Zach thought it was looking pretty good, but I just felt like it had to go further. Once again, with, with Grant Freckleton, who we were borrowing from Animal Logic, he developed this workflow and I have the menu of it somewhere in my house of the six or seven or eight steps you had to go through using three or four computer programs including Photoshop and I think maybe Shake and Quake and other things and filters and layers and all the stuff that I don't understand to get that look so that's why you can't just go into your grading thing or use a filter as they say now and get that look because it was very very complicated recipe Mm -hmm. Has it gotten easier now, though? I don't know if you can. I haven't seen anything like it. Of course, I mean, it's been done. There's cooler things now. Yeah. If you look at if you look at it now, it's kind of dated and, and a little inconsistent because we had so many vendors and this crazy recipe that if you look at it, it's a little inconsistent. But but still, the it's a cool, weird look. That, along with the weird painterly backgrounds, I think that's how it had that look. Well, it was a very fresh look, and that story... It, I mean, it is a movie, but it feels different than other movies. Like it feels written different. The characters are, the actors are acting differently. There's everybody's kind of in, in sync in, in a different style than we were used yeah. to seeing in cinemas at the time coming from, and you've done a lot of comic book related material coming from something that in itself is kind of a cinematic presentation. Like how much did you look at the original Frank Miller comic book and think of it as was it serving suggestions was it storyboards were there iconic moments specifically that you went out of your way to capture from that because it's, i mean obviously it's got to be a movie it's you're not making a comic book yes good point because a lot of people say they captured it frame for frame if you look at this not even close right movie coverage is so weird and boring no comic no comic book writer in their right mind would do movie coverage mm-hmm you know, over, 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 close up, close up, close up, close up, close up, close up. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. Um, so we, it was a very traditional filmmaking with the addition of, like you said, exactly. We chose six, seven, eight exact iconic moments that were exactly reproduced as best we could from the book, mm -hmm. which gives you the illusion that it's super faithful when not totally. It can, I mean, it can't I would be. say more than eight. There are yeah. a lot of. Seems. Well, obviously, it's done with an outrageous amount of deference and and, and love of the original Frank yes, Miller material. Absolutely. It's not an adaptation that throws away the source and just goes and does its own thing. Right. It's trying to, I think, win over. Like, I had never seen the comic book before I saw the movie. So I got the comic book after I saw mm -hmm. that, that movie. When I saw it, I was like, you captured the feeling of the comic book. And then it seemed like there were some really specific moments. And I think that that moves into Watchmen, which is a comic book that I practically memorized in high school. That was one of those things that Hollywood had been trying to tackle for yes. 20 years before oh, yeah. you guys did it. Yeah. Can you talk at all about the experience specifically from where you were standing from cinematography, like how you broke that very iconic comic book into a movie? A lot. That, again, Zach being very, very involved with everything. Assembled a great crew. The production designer, the amazing Alex McDowell, broke down like the color palette of the comic book and utilized that in his pre-production paintings and how he made the sets. We see the sets first before anything, right? So that is a big part to do with it. And by the way, we built that all outside New York in one place. Oh, wow. <laughs> there was a there was an abandoned lot, and we dug trenches, put the cable in, paved the... We. I didn't do anything. <laughs> the streets. You weren't out there with the tar and, the, no. and, a, and a shovel. No, in my opinion. <laughs> like for the cabling, it was all yeah. underground. The asphalt, the sidewalks, the buildings that were just flats, of course. But if you went down certain streets, it became the other neighborhood. Oh, wow. So in only that three or four blocks, the entire city from the Greystone to the where Moloch lived, mm -hmm. the other side of the street was where the, the whole uh, Gunga Diner is. Yeah. Is also, where, but you can't see it, is also where the, the Owlship lands were cleverly shot in all these different directions where it seemed like a much bigger place, but it was just several intersections. How much pressure were you under from the studio, from fans, from whatever, to get as close to that because I feel like today if someone was going to adapt Watchmen they would do it as a TV series and it, you could make two seasons of TV out of the out of that comic. I think they are. Are they really? Are they redoing? The rumor comes out every year. 
redoing the Watchmen? Why would they do that? But to me, it's it's like you had so much to compress, so much story to compress, yeah. and got you know we're outrageously faithful to that comic mm-hmm. book. Right. Uh, like three hundred, were you looking at iconic images from the comic book and trying to find them? Watchmen is way more of a story driven thing yeah. than three hundred, which and is reality based. Well, again, I think we did boring music cover- movie coverage mixed in with certain shots that are right out of the book. Mm -hmm. But unlike 300, where you could look at it and say, it's painterly, we want this look. What was the look of Watchmen? If you look at the illustration by Dave Gibbons, it was amazing, but it's not realistic. Yeah, it's very comic booky. It's very line drawing, and the colors are kooky. So I was thinking, how do I emulate that? How do I be faithful to that? And the truth is, I couldn't. I knew it was in the 70s. And I had long discussions with Zach. How much do I make it look like the 70s? Because I can. But it's, is it going to look like the Brady Bunch? <laughs> <laughs> is it going to look like a caricature of the 70s? By the way, some of it was. Like if you look at the talk show and things like that. It would be, and also it would be, all the sideburns, all the guys with sideburns felt yes. like. <laughs> right. Stuff that's even before the camera. Yeah. But I, but I was at a loss because we couldn't really come out, couldn't verbalize or, or codify exactly how to get that look. So I have to say it was completely by instinct because I couldn't, before it got to a set, I couldn't say, I know how the light's going to fall on the person. I was actually just looking at, someone sent me the link again for some reason of Rorschach in the uh, prison where, you know, he uh, starts a fight. Yeah, you're stuck in here with me. You're stuck in here with me, right? Pours the oil on it. My idea, by the way, on how to keep the oil in that thing because I knew, because I love cooking, that you can't pull oil out from a fryer. <laughs> 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 on the text counter, you can't do that. Everyone's like, I mean, like, why is he such an ass? You can't, you can't it'll just nothing will come out. But if you build panels in it, a whole anyway. That was smart. So, <laughs> so if and I, I looked at that and I go, that looks really cool. But that's not at all how the comic book sequence looks, mm-hmm. as far as the lighting and the feel and the color. But I just had to go into each scene and then say, how interesting can I make this look? How cool can I make the colors? How, what kind of do the contrast and composition? Just, I don't know. It's like, it's weird, complete line instinct because I mm-hmm. did not have the book with me. Even if I did, I couldn't say this is going to drive it. Zach was driving the compositions because he was looking at the book and he, you know, knows his shots. But as far as the light scheme that I was, that I was doing it was completely artistic license. And the fact that you say that you think it works, then that's a great compliment because I was winging it. I yeah. can't imagine a better adaptation of that book. Somebody gave me that book when I was, you know, 16 years old and I memorized it. And I remember at the time there were rumors that Terry Gilliam was going to adapt Watchmen mm-hmm. and uh, Robert De Niro was going to play Night Owl. And I had kind of this fantasy football version of Watchmen in my head that was done by a pre-12 Monkeys Terry Gilliam. I wasn't skeptical about the Zack Snyder approach because 300 had been so good. And I'm also a humongous fan of his adaptation of uh, Dawn of the Dead. So I thought he was, yeah. I actually thought he was, he was a great choice. The interesting thing about Watchmen to me, and I think this is one of the reasons Alan Moore like distances himself from all of the adaptations is that Watchmen is a comment on comic books in comic book form. And so yes. there's kind of a question of like, how do you make a movie that's a comment on that? Although by the time we get to Watchmen, mm-hmm. we're starting to get to this period of a lot of superhero movies anyway. Yeah. So it almost comes back around in a weird way. That's the super irony that I don't know everyone realizes. It's like the anti superhero thing. It's like yeah. the Incredibles, right? Which can be argued was just like Watchmen. But yeah, that, that was <laughs> like, I don't think, I think Zach was so excited to do this anti-comic book thing, having no idea that later this other thing would be happening. <laughs> this other thing, <laughs> this other little thing called DC Cinematic Universe. Yeah. <laughs> no, but but to me, that that's an interesting thing. And then, the, so the two of you went from that to working on Sucker Punch, correct? Yes. Okay, so Sucker Punch is like a really hard movie to encapsulate for people because it's yes. like every element of design crammed into it's like an everything burger of a, yes. of a movie. How did you go about? Because also there's a lot of visual effects in in that movie, and I feel like there were you're you're building you know like Lost is not outrageously full of visual effects, and then mm-hmm. you know you go to 300, which is VFX dependent, but you like you said if it was close enough to touch, you guys were filming, you yeah. built it. Then Watchmen, I feel like, is heightened from that and more real in some ways and mm-hmm. way bigger in other ways. And then you go to Sucker Punch, which feels like beyond fantasy to me. Like it's just like fantasy blown up. How much of that is cinematography? How much of that is production design? At this point, how much of a of a shorthand do you have with, with uh, Zack Snyder to create these huge visuals? We have a great shorthand. We have a lot of meetings, of course, but not as many meetings as you would think because 
when he describes something to me or shows something, I, I kind of get it right away. He, of course, now uh, for this movie enlisted yet another amazing production designer, Rick Carter, Oscar winner and frequent collaborator with uh, Steven Spielberg. And he would just sit there. In my mind, he's sitting there smoking a joint, but he wasn't. But he would just like go off in these tangents of his philosophy of what's going on in these girls' minds and why all these things would happen. And then he had this brilliant idea, which is also a great financial idea, about when the girls are in these dreams, it's the same sets, but they're redressed. Mm-hmm. So the brothel is, is also the theater, but a lot of the, all the, so the facades of the, 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 like the insane asylum is also the crazy castle where the monsters come out of there's, there's all these repeating things if you look close. There's so many Easter eggs in that movie, it's crazy. But the, um, but the production design, the color of uh, the sets and everything was insane. The look of the environment, which is so much a part of, of, of it all is, you know, again, Rick Carter. But, you know, I just try to put the lighting in that seems appropriate to make the people move through these spaces. Well, I don't know if it's a post effect or something, but I would also include Sucker Punch in this list. And it's specifically those three movies you did with Zack Snyder, 300, Watchmen, and Sucker Punch, that there's something textural about it. There's something so specific Mm -hmm. about the look that I've never seen anyone else do exactly that look that the two of you did in those three movies. Hmm. Anyway, I don't know if there isn't anything more to that, but is is there a specific way that you're achieving this texture, this... I, I, I don't know how to describe it. Of course, like I said, we have this weird chemistry uh, recipe on 300 that Watchmen and Sucker Punch did not have. They're pretty straightforward. Looks, If you are on there on set, it looks pretty much like that. Oh, okay. And there's no weird things we did. You know, like the green and cyan, the colors and the hallways at Sucker Punch, that's, that's in the light. And all three of those were shot on film, correct? Yes. Okay, so Super 8, coming back around to you started making films with J.J. Abrams on Super 8, and then you made a film with J.J. Abrams called Super 8. It started with a weird phone call again. Did it? Yeah. He called and said, Larry, there's a movie you really have to do. I go, wow, I haven't heard that in a long time. But, uh, <laughs> okay. So he goes, you got to read the script. I said, okay, send it to me. He goes, no, you have to come. I'm on the set. Come visit me. I'm doing a pilot right now. Come visit, meet me at USC. So I go there and I go, thanks for the script. I go, no, no, you can't leave. You have to read it here. <laughs> oh, really? Go, Why not? JJ, you know, top secret and it's got, you know, more and more crazy ever since Star Trek for good reason. Well, he's, so, he's well, he's the, the magic box guy. So yeah, he's always kind of creating a mystery. Like, you know, you think about Cloverfield right. and just kind of the mystery that was hanging around Cloverfield for a year and a half. Right. But <laughs> there's a good reason. But I couldn't just sit over there on the steps and read it. So thank God they had a company move. And so I got to stop in Chinatown and, and uh, read the script while having Chinese food. Yum. So I, I'm reading it and I go, oh, no, kids. Oh, I hate these coming of age kid movies. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think I have to do this? And then, oh, <laughs> monsters. Wow. Oh, cool. This is cool. So I'm like, when do we start, right? Martin Whist was production designer on that. Interestingly, also on Predator, which I just shot. And he was amazing. Again, the set design and everything. The hardest part was with all the kids, we had to use three cameras. And up to this point, I'm used to using one camera, maybe two if we have to. But JJ also, also from TV likes to use three cameras. So he's used to that. So that was on really Lost, hard. were you using multiple cameras? No. Well, maybe two. Mm-hmm. But, but, you know, some people use three like all the time and some use even more. No names. <laughs> um, but it's harder and you compromise, right? Because you see the other lights, one shot is better in composition, one has the good light, the two cameras might not have the best light. But when it's about performance and like JJ's TV background is, it is all about performance. Not that it's not about visuals, but that's the priority. And especially when you have the kids and you, and you have late hours and the chemistry in an ensemble thing, that's the way it had to be. Yeah. So once again, guess what? I'm doing a, a period piece from the 70s. Nice. Right? It was just like Watchmen. I'm going, what's going on here? So again, we have the talk. Okay, what's the look? Are we going to try to make it look like 70s, like a parody? Like, you know, like SNL skit? Or is it, uh, what's the look? And again, I don't know. <laughs> it's, we, we look at things and it's like, Zach, you look at a movie, you look at like half me. You know that thing where you always watch movies with the director? Yeah, yeah. Zach, JJ don't want to do that. Really? Yeah, because they, we want to do something different. But to me, Super 8 feels like such a throwback to Spielberg movies of the 80s. Oh, yeah, really. but that's already in us. 
Yeah. So when he when we said Spielberg and I said Close Encounters and JJ goes yes okay that's all you have to say. So he wanted to shoot an anamorphic because by this time JJ well I guess he started with Mission Impossible anamorphic and I heard these nightmare stories and that's why a young cinematographer is scared of anamorphic because the depth of field and it's gonna be out of focus and all the stuff and and um, so I was very scared. Luckily I got a crew that was used to anamorphic and they got kind of schooled on how to how to do it and jj already had the experience of using these lenses the c's and the e series from panavision with the crazy flares right mm-hmm. he might be known for a uh, flare or yes. two we use the same lenses i actually had some of the same that same two camera operators he uses and so it was it was great as a matter of fact when we had to go really fast and we had night exteriors we we're shooting down two ways and you have you know your um bb lights you know those are the cranes yeah. and the giant lights that act like the moon far away you can't reposition them most people can't they don't you don't have the time i mean my gaffer had to figure out where he could put those lights hopefully they're not in the shot so two things happened <laughs> we didn't have time to move those and sometimes they were in the shot but jj goes so they're in the shot well it's a cool flare up there what's wrong with that <laughs> oh that's a good point <laughs> so if you look at it you're gonna see lights everywhere even to the point where i've had friends say you know my daughter watched that thing she saw these weird blue lights and that that's how you know the monsters are coming, right? <laughs> yes, that's exactly what it is. So here's a random question. Since oh, wait, you so s- let me finish. This. Oh, oh, sorry. So what would happen was if we're looking down one way, that's the backlight, right? Mm-hmm. And typically, you find a better way to do the front light and make it pretty. We would just use the other light that's half a mile away and turn it down, and that would be the front light, and that would be the fill. Oh, interesting. And then we went the other way. We do the other way. So basically, the key light's like a quarter mile away. Well, can you get away with a little bit more because they're kids, so they don't yes, have wrinkly faces, exactly. and they all look as good as they're ever exactly. going to look? Exactly. That was the other thing I was going to say. That's why the hard light. That's why you'll see lights in the shots. That's why there's so many flares. If you Google annoying flares in Super 8, you'll get like a million responses. You'll see. <laughs> well, post Star Trek, I think that, you know, J.J. Abrams, a lot of people pointed out his love of lens flares. And have you know made lots of fun of it. In fact, uh, Andrew Kramer, who's a VFX guy who works for him all the time, oh, yeah, yeah. made the best lens flare plugin for yeah, After Effects that has ever existed. Right. And it's like that can't be a coincidence. Right. But in my head, and I didn't actually watch Close Encounters. I only used my memory of it, so I wouldn't do a complete you know duplication. But in my head, I see flares everywhere. I yeah, don't yeah. Know if they really are. No, I think they are actually. Okay, but I don't think it's inappropriate. I think it's a cool style, uh, right. style choice. Well, I have got you know people probably mostly from Twitter saying things like a tweet that said that blue light went across someone's face. You can't have, you can't have blue in front of someone's face. And I'm like, oh man, yeah, I like, forgot I, I, my anamorphic handbook. Sorry, I forgot <laughs> to bring it with me. You know, I deeply apologize for the blue flare across the face, but I love it. So I will always love it. So since you started out making Super 8 films with J.J. Abrams and Super 8 is a movie about kids in at that time making films on Super 8, are you one of the kids in the movie? No, but he might be. I can't say anything more than that. <laughs> <laughs> it was so great. That, that Riley, the man, he just emailed me the other day. He said like... He emailed me and said, I'm going to be in town. Can I please get a pass for the Magic Castle? He's so good. He was so great in that, wasn't he? Do you watch Stranger Things and think you kind of <laughs> you kind of created that genre? I can't say that because I haven't actually seen it. But oh. other people tell me that. Stranger Things is amazing. a lot. Stranger Things is so much like Super 8. And a friend of mine concocted a whole conspiracy theory that the Duffer Brothers were really just J.J. Abrams. <laughs> uh, I mean... There's been other things with kids at night and aliens and riding bikes. It's not. I do think Super 8 showed us a nostalgia for a time that probably a lot of us didn't even realize that we had. And then Stranger Things just mines that nonstop. Mm. It's really good. You should check it out. I hear good things. It's excellent. By the way, that scene where when they're in the room, when he shows the movie of his mother, his dearly departed mother, and she comes in the middle of the night and they show the hit the home movies of him and her. And she's crying and telling the story. Mm -hmm. One take. She's so amazing. People have a hard time looking at their own work and seeing what is special oh, yeah. about their work yeah. because you were in it, you were there. Yeah. When you're okay. when you're seeing it, for instance, Robert Richardson has a very specific top lighty mm. with yeah. like some kind of a pro mist kind yeah, of a yeah, look yeah. that's very specific. And, and expected like, maybe. Yeah. 
with your stuff, it's not. It doesn't look like a filter or, or something. It just. It just has a. It doesn't look like other films, mm. like those ones specifically that I'm talking about. And I do feel like Batman versus Superman has that as well. Well, it's funny you say that about film though, because there were film stocks. Because you know, we had to push 300 because of the slow motion. We had to push parts of Sucker Punch for a slow motion. We had to push Super 8 because of the nights. You know, one or two stops, and it was really grainy, even to the point where I'm like, wow, that's pretty grainy and also batman versus superman you know you look at like a born movie or something like that there's like a graininess that happens in those and it doesn't like what's going on in your films i mean i'm not i'm not bagging on those i think those look exactly like what they're supposed to look like but in yours maybe it is the grain but there's something about it that brings out a different texture in skin tones or in sets um i don't know it's so hard for me to describe but i've always noticed it in specifically like starting with 300 and kind of watching it in the theater how do you get that look i mean i always wonder that whenever i'm watching anything that i've never seen you know when i've never seen anything like that before maybe another time like we have to go through frames and look at them because maybe or maybe it's the grade or maybe it's where i like to place the exposures but i've seen I see things all the time, you know, where I think that's ballsy. That how do they get that? That's really dark. I can't believe they. I thought I was dark. There's people that <laughs> everything's dark, right? But I, I don't have any special tools or tricks or this mm-hmm. or your things or film or. I mean, it just I devices. think it's devices. It's just normal. I just think it's how you how filters. you see it. It's just the style that you bring just by being yourself. I'm assuming. Let's talk about Kong Skull Island and then Batman versus okay. Superman. With Kong Skull Island, we've had several attempts, or a f- eh, yeah, several attempts to reboot a Kong kind of a movie, or Kong, and this one is kind of throws away the rule book of remaking the original King Kong. It goes about it very differently, and when I saw it, I was like, "This really is like Apocalypse Now with a with a giant gorilla." Was that intentional? Oh yeah, from meeting number one. Really? I went to Jordan's office and there was posters of Apocalypse Now, like still frame grabs on the on the wall. It was always going to be anamorphic. If we talked about Apocalypse Now, we talked about Thin Red Line and things like that. So it was meant, always meant to be you know, cinematic and anamorphic and epic. We're in giant blockbuster town where I'm sure that this movie took years of, of prep to kind of get to where it was. Oh, yeah. Where's the where is the nut of creativity for yourself when you go in to do that? Like, how are you how are you influencing the look and the design of the shots and the sequences? Also, like Tony Liberatore, who was on our our podcast, did storyboards for that. And it's something like a lot of these movies that you're doing have a lot of previs, have a lot of storyboards. Oh, yeah. What part of your creativity comes out of that when they're when they're so designed? That's a good question, because when I get in there, and, and this had been in pre-pro for a long time, and I think was in hiatus, they might have even had another cinematographer. So by the time I, came, I got in there, people had been on payroll for a year or something. Really? Right? And the whole office was just full of, where do you have time to do all these paintings and previs and pictures? Because they've been doing it that long. And frame grabs from movies, and they had really been doing their homework. So Jordan, you know, is a master of pop culture, and he had all his references, you know, from Miyazaki to, I mean... If you could see the paintings, they're all over the place. And so he had very clear ideas of the feel he wanted and the color palettes. So you're right. Sometimes you go in there late in the game, you're thinking, well, what do I have to give to it? Well, there's a lot you can give to it because if they have the design for the clothes and for the monsters and they've picked the locations, they have the color palette, then I'm still the one who has to record it on film, right? Mm-hmm. They they have the set there, but I, my lighting has to make sense within the context of the vision to make it work. But often that's not to the day before or the day of. An example is, you know, that the biggest set we had in Australia was the inside of that ship that was crashed there. And oh, yeah, the yeah. Shrine. Huge set, right? It should have been built outside because there's massive holes and you can see through it outside and there's all these sun shafts, which are very hard to simulate, especially when there's all these holes because you'd have to use 100 really expensive lights and there's no real way to do it. So I have to think how to make it look like the the pre-production sketch. So I have to selectively make holes where a few shafts can come through, all the shafts we can afford, (laughs) (laughs) and um, outside, you know, have bushes and and white out there and blow it out so it seems like we're outside. Yeah. And then I have to have a level of blueness in there for ambience, and then also firelight is in there, and I have to simulate the firelight, right? So all that, you go into the set and it's just an empty shell in a stage, but to make that all come alive with those colors and the shafts and the tones and the fill and the ambience and the smoke, that's all me. So there's a lot to do. And how long do you have to do something like that? Is that days and days of pre-lighting? Oh yeah. I mean, first you have the, the drawings before I even get there and then I have in my head have some ideas. Talk to the gaffer who I've never met while I'm still in Hawaii shooting, um, get there, look at it, 
seeing how much room we have for lights, talk it through with the key grip, production designer, refine it. A week, maybe we're pre-lighting because that took up a whole stage. That yeah, set. That's it's an enormous set. set, yeah. And it all happens, you know, really quick. It almost seems like theater lighting at that point, like you're... A little bit, yeah. On Kong also, there's like so many visual effects shots. And, you know, at this point, you've done so many movies that are loaded with visual effects. How? And this is a question I genuinely don't know the answer to. How much design influence do you have on the lighting or the setting up of you know like for instance there's that scene in Kong Skull Island where the tentacled whatever it is octopus Mm -hmm. kind of attacks Kong and I assume most of that's VFX Mm -hmm. are you consulted on the lighting on how to make that look like the rest of the movie well that was in Vietnam where I had no lights so we would shoot (laughs) it was slightly overcast on that day and whatever we shot that's what it is they have to make so VFX has to make it land in there but when they put the co- so like when they put Kong in there and they mm-hmm. put the octopus or whatever squid thing that yes. was in that whatever that Lovecraftian monster mm-hmm. was, do you have oversight over the way that the light is hitting the creature, or is that all VFX? That's all VFX. Mm-hmm. If it was specific, they'd be different. But like I said, our mandate was to have a gorilla crew there, minimal lighting and grip and cameras. So literally, when you said gorilla crew, my brain <laughs> literally went to <laughs> a totally fantastic. different place. <laughs> That's great. Skeleton crew. How's that? Um, and then so... A skeleton crew on Skull Island. Minimal. Documentary. Yes. National Geographic. That's what I was told over and over again. Quick and nimble. So I had zero lights on that sequence. Really? Maybe a bounce card for a close-up on Toby. And so you just shoot it and you make room for the Kong and you have the storyboards, the previs, uh-huh. on an iPad and you shoot the shots. That only took a few hours to do that. Wow. That seems like one of the scenes I remember the most from that movie too. Like I Zero thought- lights. Zero anything. Tripod in the water. <laughs> that's awesome. And I think actually that's a great thing for people who are just starting out to think about. Like, you know, you don't, you don't need it all the time. You don't need to have mm-hmm. all the toys. Well, it's also impossible because we had to go in like five rowboats from one location an hour across the water to go to this tiny little place. Someone lived there in that little lagoon. We had to cr- crawl up, go through their house over these rocks. And then there's that lagoon thing mm-hmm. in the middle of Vietnam. That's it. You can't bring any equipment in. You can't bring a generator, silks cranes nothing but again as someone mentioned here on in twitter about asking oh here here it is do you have any stories of filming on location for kong from bennett Lai at the sifu abides <laughs> and were there any changes to your process due to the land's natural beauty was it greatly different from filming in sound stages yes i just told you that we used tons of lights and sound stages when we went to vietnam on the last third of the movie i was told to bring very little uh anything so i didn't that's awesome that's great to hear, honestly. I'm going to watch it again with that in my head. Well, there's one thing. like We really wanted to bring a remote head, uh, a crane arm on a remote head, but a lot of people were saying that's too much money. But we're saying if we don't, every shot is going to be on a tripod in a boat or on the land. If we have a boat, we can do arm moves. We can mm. go along the boat. We can crane up and down. And otherwise, it's just going to look like National Geographic Special. Actually, National Geographic specials look really, really good these days. Yeah. Better than a lot of things. They've all got drones. So it's the wrong it's the wrong analogy. But like nineteen eighties geographic specials. Yes. And even the producer gets we have to bring that thing. So look at it, like when the ship's go the boat's going down and we're kinda of doing one eighties around it and they're on the bow, you know, like King of the World type shots. And we just left that thing on a boat like overnight. It wasn't that big a deal. So it's a little bit like your situation with Lost as well, where you're having to find low tech solutions. Believe it or not, like I do not want the most complicated <laughs> situation or expensive. You know, I think it's the simplest is the best. Um, oh, yeah. But to answer this question. Yeah, we a lot of the exteriors. Thank God it was like just a thin, thin, thin overcast sky. So everything was nice and soft. So the whole battle at the end, you don't have to really worry about the sun changing mm-hmm. and or actors having sun in their face and all that. The only time the sun came out and screwed us is when they're kind of fixing that boat. And there's a couple scenes there where the sun suddenly came out and there's nothing we can do. But considering where they were there for all that time, that consistent overcast is what saved us. If it came out, I might not be alive right now. <laughs> I killed myself. <laughs> but I prayed really hard. I prayed to the lighting gods and there's ways to do that, but I can't reveal oh, the secrets. You can tell us. <laughs> <laughs> That's really inspirational though. It's, it's great to hear, you know, that... And and that was also, have you shot digitally yet at all? Have you made a feature digitally? Ah, oh, remember I told you about the special anamorphic lens for Kong Skull Island? Yeah. That's because so badly you want it to look like film. Ah. That was digital. The whole movie is digital. That's great. Yes. What did you shoot that on? The Alexa. Anamorphic with a lot of post-production tricks. 
there's some grain, there's some detuning, there's some chromatic aberration, there's some vignetting. If you call up right now and look at the edges of the corners of the film, you would see mm-hmm. something interesting. Not so great when I showed it Panavision. <laughs> like within two seconds, Dan Sasaki, and the, the, their lens designer, goes, what happened to the edges? You put that in later, didn't you? I was like, yes, you're not supposed to notice that. <laughs> we tried not to tell the studio when they busted us. They figured it out. So what do you think is the line with that kind of stuff when you're adding uh, post vignettes and you're, and you're doing stuff to make a lens that feels like a lens from a different time? It's silly because <laughs> remember I, I told you I, I thought we, we shot Super 35 with Zach and we were never going to do anamorphic because it was just kind of – anamorphic was like a niche weird thing, right? Yeah. That weirdos did. Actually, when I did Now You See Me, the director wanted to use anamorphic. I thought, oh, man, this is going to be cool. And then JJ wanted to do it. And then – well, before that, JJ did – but now, with digital, Panavision can't keep up with all the anamorphic lenses being rented, and people are making more and more. Why? Because people want digital, but they also want it to feel more cinematic. And for some reason, to a lot of people, anamorphic means nostalgia and cinematic, mm-hmm. which it shouldn't, because the reason anamorphics were invented has nothing to do with any of that. And actually, you're getting more capture sensor. You know, it, it's sharper, but that's. But, um, Ironically, it's worse glass, or it was worse glass. Also, and an outmoded, silly way of trying to make a certain shape on a certain piece of film. And the Alexa does not have a four by three sensor, correct? Yeah, it does have a four by three sensor. Yeah, so you can use the full sensor to get the full yes. anamorphic. Yes, but when it's Skull Island, the Mini did not have it yet, but it does now. Nice. Let's kind of close out what we're talking about, talking about uh, Batman versus Superman which is your uh, return to... Wait, did I fool you and you think you thought that was shot on film, Skull Island? I did. You, the expert? Uh, am I an expert? Uh, yes, I actually did. I, I thought wow. it was shot on film. That is the best compliment I've gotten all week. Well, and also, like, I feel like you're somebody who kind of sticks to film for most of your projects. Well, I've been lucky to work with directors that want to film. Mm-hmm. It's never my choice. I can't make that decision. I'm not that big of a But famous. if you were tasked with making that decision... You would go with film, correct? Or well, yeah, every director I worked with said, please film, and the studio goes, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> Let's finish up with Batman versus Superman. Uh, so it's your return to working with Zack Snyder because mm-hmm. you didn't work together on Man of Steel. True. And it also, you are introducing us to, like, basically, you're introducing us to the DC Cinematic Universe. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, I feel like you're kind of setting the look for the DC Cinematic Universe because mm-hmm. every the Wonder Woman movie is going to have to feel like your version of Wonder Woman and so on. And there are going to be a lot of movies that this has to connect to. Yeah, kind of. So how does the architecture of that work? Again, you're creating a look that's going to have to ripple through a lot of other projects. And the way Zack Snyder conceived of Man of Steel and Batman versus Superman is not like Christopher Nolan's Batman universe. It doesn't look the same. It doesn't feel the same. So like, what are your marching orders? But also like, what are you bringing to it? How are you kind of putting your fingerprint on it? If I could ask. I really belabor that a lot because when I think of the new dawn of how these kind of movies can be awesome, I think of Christopher Nolan and I think of Wally Pfister and I'm thinking that was a game changing. Totally. And I thought, what can I do? I know Wally, but I wasn't going to call him up and have a discussion about it. <laughs> but I didn't want to duplicate what he did. But is it cocky to say I want to do something different or something better? A little. Not different, but better. Can I do better? I don't know. It was pretty damn good. So that's what I would stay, stay up at night thinking. What can I do? For, what can I bring to the party that's unique and people will like and that I can be proud of. And that was probably the hardest, you know, with a movie, the kind of thing I had to uh, tackle. So I started to play around when we did our screen tests of Ben Affleck in, in the costume. And we did have screen tests of Gal Gadot and out of Henry, of course, and well, everybody. And as we did these makeup tests and costume tests, I, I was trying different types of lighting. One thing I realized is that on Batman, I could go much harder light than previous i was looking at nolan's film i was looking at past ones with michael keaton whatever and of course it's the star and they want to have nice soft light we've had discussion already about nice soft light for the close-ups that's what you do yeah but i realized that they're not close-ups it's like black rubber and a mouth yeah yeah (laughs) nostrils but that's in keeping with batman because he's batman and he's night and he's evil and it's dark and batman's almost always only seen at night right so i i just want to see how far i could take the the contrast and the the hard light on batman and that was the first step and it's also darkening up a Superman kind of a thing too, which is yeah, because he's often with him. Yeah, but he also had a face, so he would he could take more light, and I could add more fill and soften him up and make him and look better. But again, Henry has such a perfect face 
that he could take the hard line as well. So I got lucky. Now this is the funny thing. Zach and I never had a big, again, long discussion of the exact same look. But it's like when we're shooting, sometimes it's like darker or darker or like brighter or more, you know. As we shoot each scene, the whole scene evolved. For example, this is the one I'm really proud of is, you know that scene where he's rescuing the uh, the girl in Mexico from the fire and it comes down in, amongst all the Day of the Dead people? Yeah, yeah. I had no idea until we did that, what we're gonna do. Cause I knew the guy was gonna come down. He's gonna go like this, we're gonna do one eight, but I didn't know it was gonna be like a 180 and then all one shot and then push into him. But I did know this was a, like a poor town so I knew I had to have the warm glow of the fire. But in the background, I put these weird green, because there's there's little kind of village, there's buildings back there. And um, I put this weird green light, and then there's a little bit of moonlight. But I didn't know I was going to do this and turn back around perfectly into like the the firelight. So it's so important to have the person on the blocking, because then you go, oh my gosh, I see what's happening. How much now. of this stuff, though, was, was pre-vised or uh, storyboarded beforehand? How much How much does uh, Zack Snyder rely on those on He does those a tools? lot, but I don't think that one was. All I knew was he was going to come down, we're going to pan, and he was going to do his thing. I didn't know he was going to like turn around and do this look here. Yeah. But when he does that last look, look how he's right into the key light. See that subtle kind of moon green thing on his, the back of his face? Yeah, yeah. It's like perfect. And the fall off on these people but you don't know that to the rehearsal and then you make some small adjustments sometimes you go this is all working you change the whole thing in that case but that's like a kind of a this a, just ma- magic and but oh it's like God, a bravura kind of cinematic moment that you mm-hmm. created there with the camera work right well we could feel it we're all did the thing and we're all like in the monitor we're like whoa you know that kind of yeah. thing usually it's like mm, let's fix some things but sometimes you get lucky and it just nails <laughs> it right but are you more proud of that or are you more proud of the things when you have to fix it because there's so many problems I don't know. It's all fun. You kind of brought it up a little bit earlier, but you're you're a magician. You're a, man, a member of the Magic Castle, correct? I am, yes. How long have you been doing magic? Well, without going too long into it, when I was young, I had a magic set and I liked magic. And then nerdy guys like magic, but it kind of wasn't that good. But I think as an adult, I, it rekindled my interest. And then I um, met some magicians, befriended some, and then got more involved in the community. And then so like most of my friends are magicians now. <laughs> and so it, it can't help but wear off on you so Rub off on you magic is an art magic is about revealing and about creating suspense and stuff mm-hmm. like that do you think that it informs your cinematography oh, absolutely how, absolutely how do you think like i don't know if there's a way to quantify it, but how do you think it informs your cinematography filmmaking is just problem solving right we want a scene that look like this how do we get there but also without taking too much time and too much money <laughs> mm-hmm. it's ingenuity and if magic is nothing if not being in- ingenuity and taking what you have to make it look like something amazing when maybe not much is happening at all. Yeah. You know, and it allows you to think on your feet um, and think of principles, physical, mental, lighting, angle principles that you can apply to cinematography all the time. Do you perform actually at the Magic Castle? No, because I have stage fright. I'll perform for friends or on set or at parties or at restaurants, but I can't go in front of an audience and that whole thing. Interesting. <laughs> It's more of an improv thing or like more like street magic before David Blaine came up with that name or how that came, name came up. You know what I mean? It just kind of organically happens when you're hanging out. I just want people to be able to come watch you perform, uh, mm-hmm. but no. not going to happen. If you do a movie with me, you'll see magic. Hopefully, I mean, on the downtime, not during <laughs> when the chips are down and the tension is on. I'm going to make that clear. <laughs> On IMDb, it said, the trivia said, he does card tricks all the time during shooting. So uh, I think that's a great place to end, though. Um, is there a place where people can go online to see your work? Obviously, you're on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. I'm inst- I less and less Twitter, but more Instagram. And what's your uh, Instagram name? Uncle Wow. Uncle Wow. W-O-W. Uncle Wow. At Uncle Wow. And you are at Larry Fong on Twitter? Yes. Uh, do you have a website or anything where people can see uh, Yeah, but it's not, I did it myself. It's not that good. But it's LarryFong.com. Shocking. But the good thing about that is that there's swag. And if you look at it, you can get the famous uh, Keep Calm and Larry Fong t-shirt or the Rehearsal Cat sticker, which is making its rounds around the world. Oh, and I got you some. Oh, nice. It's, it's, Nobody's it's, ever brought it's us stuff. Business cat. And he's saying, if you shoot the rehearsal, it's not a rehearsal. Dumbass. It doesn't <laughs> say dumbass, but that's implied. And it's hashtag rehearsal cat. And he's on Instagram. I'm laughing. And if you look, he, <laughs> you hashtag. Wow. So awesome. If you hashtag it, you can see him all around the world on carts. And whenever I bring this to a set, they go, oh, we've seen those. I'm putting this on my camera case. So I did not come up with the phrase or the business cat. But I did make the sticker because I just want—I was doing an experiment to see how popular it could be. So, so everybody, uh, check out uh, the hashtag Rehearsal Cat. 
on Instagram. On Instagram. Uh, Larry Funk, thank you so much for coming out. I, I feel like I could Thanks, talk guys. to you for seven days. It was so much fun. Thanks. So that was Larry Fong. It was awesome having Larry on here. Larry, you're an awesome dude. Thank you very much for doing it. Hope that after uh, The Predator comes out, we can bring you back. Have you maybe tell us a couple of cool stories about that. The Predator, written and directed by Shane Black. Shane Black, who was in the original Predator. That's so awesome. Yeah, that, and, and who would have thought that two governors would have come out of that movie? Two governors and Bill Duke, the director, Bill Duke. Um, maybe being a governor is a bigger deal. Maybe I buried the lead there, but you get my point. Anyway, so Ilya, who is our war story? Our war story comes from none other than Johnny Durango. Possibly one of the coolest names in show business. Uh, you know, Ben, you're you're selling yourself short there. Ben Rock is pretty damn cool for a showbiz name. But you're uh, right, Johnny Durango. I'll take it. But yeah. Johnny Durango is like, like when I heard that, I was like, that can't be his name. And it's like, that's totally his that's name. That's really his name. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it was pretty great to have Ben Rock interviewing Johnny Durango. You know, <laughs> so you, I, I pro- you, you I guys could have had a, gra- a gravitas off. <laughs> I probably so. told you this, but at one point I was working in an office uh, doing some post with two other people, uh, Juan Bravo and Jeff Knight. And our and the guy who hired us walked in and said, and was interview, was introducing us to some big executive at Disney or something. And he was like, uh, this is Ben Rock, Juan Bravo, and Jeff Knight. And the guy was like, sure it is. <laughs> well, um, yeah, <laughs> I think that would have been my reaction too. It was so, like, these are your porn star names. So Johnny Durango. You can work with us at Disney at some point. Anyway, Johnny's awesome, and he will be in our next episode, and here is his war story. And now, war stories. So on the last night of shooting a small town crime, we're doing a flashback scene, which involves a shootout. And we're back at this industrial train depot where we shot our largest scale set for the entire movie. We are 34 days in, this is day 35, and there's there's no turning back. We have to finish the movie tonight. There's no money to go over budget. We've got to get it done. And sadly, our only source of light on the set was a condor, which was a giant backlight. We had some ground lights that were providing skims and, and front light, but our condor was our main source of lighting, and a windstorm blew in. And if you know anything working with condors, once the wind gets over a certain amount of miles per hour, you have to pull the condor down. So as the night goes on, the wind starts to pick up and my gaffer who has a wind meter on it says, this is done, we gotta bring it down. So we huddle with producers and the directors and everybody agrees for safety reasons, we have to bring it down. So it comes down. As it comes down, one of our 5Ks blows over, smashes the lens. It's okay, we got a couple more 5Ks. Wind tapers down a little bit, we put it back up in the air, we keep shooting. Everything's going good. Another 5K blows over and shatters. Gaffer says we gotta bring the uh, condor down again. So now we're getting into a situation where this is our last night of shooting. There's there's no turning back. We have to get this sequence done to make the movie. There's nobody who's gonna give us more money to, to finish this sequence if we don't get it. So it's sort of do or die. We continue on and another 5K blows over. And at this point, the uh, the gaffer comes and huddles with me and the producers and said, this is gonna continue to happen. We've got every single sandbag we have on this thing. Stands are bending because of the wind. We're just gonna have to wait it out and, and shoot intermittently in between. So we continue to do this and it's going well. The sequence is looking great, but it's clearly a hazardous condition and we have to play it safe. And I can see the sun starting to come up and I know I have one more shot that I have to get. And the shot involves the lead actor sitting on the back of an ambulance and it takes place in the evening. So the sun is starting to come up. I can see on my monitor, even if I throw an ND, stuff like that, it's starting to look like day. So I get the idea, what we need to do is we grab the DIT tent, we take the DIT tent, I think the grips are running it over, we put it over the back of the ambulance and throw down three of the four sides. I look on the monitor and it's a close enough match that I'm like, go, go, go. And we shoot the shot and we get it. And it's absolutely beautiful. And now, short ends. All right, so that was Johnny Durango's war story. Everybody look forward to Johnny Durango's episode, which is already edited, so hopefully uh, maybe shortly after NAB, and then we'll have like a big NAB roundup, and it'll be super exciting. Fantastic. Hooray. So, Ben, what is your uh, short end this week? Uh, this week, my pet obsession is blockchain, 
which I know people have talked about uh, repeatedly about currency, such as Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin's the best known use of blockchain. But I've been asking myself ever since I heard about blockchain, which is sort of a a database that's spread out over a gazillion computers across the world. I don't know exactly how many. Gazillion is accurate. Uh, it's technical. Yeah. Sorry. I know we, we try to stay away from tech on this, but I have to say gazillion. I have been wondering since the invention of blockchain if it had uses beyond that of money and tracking currency. So the idea with Bitcoin is this mysterious guy who created Bitcoin hid these Bitcoins in the internet and places and people literally mine for them and they pull them out and it's recorded on a blockchain who's got what. So if I have one Bitcoin and I give it to you or sell it to you. It disappears from you. You yeah. don't get to keep it. I don't have it, which goes against the idea of a digital file because it's copy. copy. Yeah, exactly. Copy, copy. With a digital file, I just do, you know, copy, paste, copy, paste. So I can be a millionaire, a gazillionaire. So what I have been wondering since I first heard about blockchain was, is it possible? Is it possible to create a blockchain for media files. So in other words, I make an episode of 20 seconds to live and I guess I register it on a blockchain kind of a thing and I sell it instead of just giving it away. I'm not saying I would really do that, but let's pretend for a second that I did. You sold it for four cents. For four cents. So now Ilya has has a episode of Heartless uh, from our first season of 20 Seconds to Live and he's watched it to his heart's content and a friend of his wants to buy it off of him and is willing to give him uh, three cents for it. Ooh, all right. So you're like, you know, I got a penny's worth of fucking value out of this. I'll sell it to him. And now our blockchain records your transaction. And now you no longer can play the file. If you were to keep the file, you couldn't play it. And there's no way for you to actually have a copy of the file anymore because it's tracked on this blockchain registry. Even if I had a cheap camcorder and I sat in my living room and I shot my TV screen. Well, I think that that is a fine question. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think that there's, again, if you can't do it with money, which doesn't really exist, I feel like there's a way to set it up that you couldn't do it with media files. Or in the event that you did do it with media files, if one were to reach out to say YouTube, Vimeo, Daily Motion, QuickTime, blah, 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 and you had to register, it was registered on a blockchain with all of the major companies on which it could be played. Sure, you could do that. And then all it takes is one person to report it and it gets taken down. The question is, can that be enforced? Blah, blah, blah. I don't know. But the first person who ever gave me a break in the business is a woman named Amaret Jones, who was the head of marketing at Artisan Entertainment in the early 2000s. I directed my first project ever professionally for Amaret. And she recently created a company called Treaty, T-R-E-E-T-I. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. You're going to be so embarrassed if it's pronounced Trity or something else. I, I'm always embarrassed, okay. so that's okay. I, I, I've got half a blush working already. <laughs> so Amaret founded a company, and that is what they're doing, apparently. Reading, uh, it, was in, it was reported in Deadline this week, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm kind of half tempted to bring Amaret on here and see if she would, uh, she would talk to us about what her technology is. Do it. If she's willing, do it. I, I, I think that our listeners would probably find that fascinating well Amaret is is really smart and sharp and great in the business and just she's an amazing person so maybe she'd do it and uh, i would love to know more about because also the way i'm describing it might not be how she's using it it might be something more innovative and interesting than i'm describing ben i think that is fascinating and uh i would love to continue that conversation hey can i uh, tell you about my short end this week Please do. Okay, my short end is another con concept, kind of like you were talking about currency as a concept. My concept is media consolidation, and we're all aware that you know the biggest media companies continue to get bigger. Well, uh, there's a video that's kind of making the rounds right now. I watched it three times yesterday, which makes it qualify as more, sort of my obsession this week. It was uh, stunning to see local affiliate news stations all reporting the exact same story the exact same way at the exact same time. And I, I guess it's been on John Oliver. It's been or been making its, its rounds, but I'd never seen anything like that. So uh, you don't have too many places you can go sell your your content. Boy, there's not too many places now that you can report a different opinion on news, which uh, really came clear into focus. And you can find this video pretty easily on Facebook. We could probably YouTube. play a little chunk of it. Here it is. Yeah, I, I think I hear it in the background. Wait, there it is. Without checking facts first. The sharing of biased and false, false news has, has become, become all too common, common on, on social, social media. media. <laughs> this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. 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 Wow, that's scandalous. Well, anyway, it's uh, 
for me, it was a little bit of a, a wake up because I got to admit, I don't watch a lot of television news, but I always considered television news or news that you get in the newspaper to have a higher degree of credibility than what you might find online. But this just puts into really stark relief that maybe the old guard isn't as credible as you thought they were. Maybe the 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 old guard now also has to be working on their credibility. You don't automatically just get a pass because you've been doing it for a long time. I wonder uh, with regards to the specific story too, like what are the demographics of who's watching their local news? I, I've never really been a big fan of the local news and probably I get most of my news from the internet nowadays and I get it from sources that I believe are credible, you know, and sometimes I'm proven to be wrong, but, uh, but I don't, I don't watch a whole lot of, you know, dogs being pulled out of trees, kind of, kind of local news stories. And that's what this is about really. Uh, I think that uh, I'm going to start a local news network now called like Yokel local uh, news story. And I can, <laughs> <laughs> I can, you know, it's like, it's like a next door except for news and you get to, put it out all over the that's world. That's a good idea. If you if you figured out a way to connect that to next door, you might really be onto something there. Mm. Just mm. gave away a billion dollar idea to someone. There you go. News Dude. and next door. Run with it. Run with it, uh, podcast audience, and let us know how successful it was. Well, we, you won't need to let us know. We'll all be using it. That's true. I already used next door. <laughs> that's right. I don't I don't know very many people who don't right now who are under the age of maybe 60. <laughs> so I think that uh, wraps us up, though, for uh, episode 21. Yeah, it sure does. Hey, it was a great episode. Thank you so much to uh, our guests for being on and tune in next time for Johnny Durango. Yes. Thank you, Larry Fong. And future thank you to Johnny Durango. Hey, uh, who made this this, this show possible? All the music that you've heard in this episode is by Kays Alatrachi. Woo-hoo. You can find him at musicbykays.com. Hire Kays. Have him score your next project. He's you an can, amazing composer. You can probably hear a little bit of his music right now. All right. <laughs> and, and then Alana Cody. Alana Cody, our producer, our fine producer, without whom we would not be cranking these episodes nearly as quickly. And we will see you at episode 22, listeners. Ciao. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening.